By early August 1940, the Battle of Britain was a month old. The Germans had started by battering channel ports and naval convoys. The British mainland would soon be next. For the first time in its history, Britain would be fighting an air battle over home soil, a battle that, if lost, would see Britain removed from the war. Fighter Command was only five years old, but now it held the fate of the nation in its hands. Its job was brutally simple, to ensure national survival. Over the last couple of weeks, four young pilots have been battling for a unique aviation prize, a nine-hour course in a real World War II Spitfire. Our pilots first had to prove themselves on Tiger Moths, the same type of plane used by original Battle of Britain trainee pilots. Two were then selected to move on to Duxford, where they got three hours at the controls of Carolyn Grace's Mark IX Spitfire. It was civilian pilot Dave Mallon who then won through to the final leg of the competition. So over the next week, he will be learning two key Battle of Britain skills, how to fly the Spitfire in tight formation, and then the most demanding one of all, the aerobatics essential to air combat survival. But first comes navigation. Today's sortie will be a flight all the way to the south coast of England. Briefing him is Spitfire pilot Carolyn Grace. I thought it would be really significant that um, now that you've got to this stage that we go down to the area where the battle was really at its peak. Um, so we take a flight down to the south coast. We're in 12 group area here, Duxford. So we come down past Stansted, past Stapleford and head down into the south via the Thames estuary obviously. I mean, all the, way the route down. Dave will be flying will take him through skies rich in Battle of Britain memories. It was here, over London, Kent and Surrey, that the Battle of Britain was fought and won. The RAF was always outnumbered, but in the end, what proved decisive were British strategy and the leadership that conceived and implemented it. This was a battle fought as much on the ground as in the air. There was little to separate the aircraft or the pilots who flew on either side, but where the RAF and the Luftwaffe were utterly and significantly different was in their leaders. In the summer of 1940, Fighter Command was facing what people considered the most formidable air force in the world. The German Luftwaffe had been unbeatable, something its leader, Hermann Goering, boasted would never stop. Goering was an experienced airman in his own right. He had been an air ace during the First World War. He had won the highest award for bravery. He had been in command of the Richthofen squadron, which was the, the prime squadron. And he joined the Nazi party very shortly afterwards. So he was an old fighter, as Hitler had it. And Hitler, in 1933, when he came to power, made Goering responsible for what was going to be his prime weapon, his, the, the Luftwaffe. And he developed it uh, according to his, his, his own lights. It was his Luftwaffe that he had created, uh, and he saw it in his terms, uh, very much as um, the World War I fighter pilot, not with a great technical understanding, and with a view that his Luftwaffe would achieve almost anything, and that that would greatly uh, strengthen his position uh, in the German hierarchy. There's a huge myth about Goering that he was a kind of the, the amiable face of Nazism. Actually, he was a ruthless killer capable of any kind of brutality. He was a convinced, corrupt supporter of the Nazi regime. He was known in the Luftwaffe as Der Dicke, which simply means old fatso. 
he was rather a sort of grotesque figure. He dressed up in these extravagant comic opera uniforms. He wore togas. Uh, he carried a spear. He had jeweled belts. He had corsets. Somebody described him as, as a manicured mountain of powdered flab. We reported in at Goering's office. He wasn't there, he was on his way back from Paris. And then he arrived in civilian clothes, wearing a raw silk shirt with puff sleeves, a raw silk cravat with a great big emerald on it here, and riding breeches with red boots. Even by today's standards, it was a pretty daring get-up. I think when Goering said that his Luftwaffe could take Britain out of the war, given what it had achieved in Poland and in France, Hitler was prepared to let him see if he could do that. Uh, it suited everybody. Um, the Ar German army and the German navy were not at that stage ready to invade. And here was Goering saying, I can do the whole thing with you for you with my Luftwaffe. Um, Hitler would have been stupid not to let him get on and see if he could do it. What Goering needed to achieve was air supremacy. This meant destroying the RAF's ability to oppose his aircraft. Precisely the tactic that had brought France to its knees earlier in 1940. The plan was to knock the RAF out. Once you have air superiority, then they could initiate the invasion. What Goering thought he could do was to render the southeast of England defenseless from the air by building up the pressure on the RAF and threatening to bomb London. Goering wanted to be able to apply the force and told Hitler that the Luftwaffe could deal with the RAF fairly quickly and that all he needed was about a week of good weather. But despite his promise to Hitler, Goering had no real plan of how to achieve this. He hadn't thought he had needed one. Send his fighters over and they would destroy any plane that came up to challenge them. Essentially, the idea was that our fighter boys are so good and the 109 is such a fantastic machine that as long as we can get the British fighters into the air, our chaps will shoot them down in droves and that'll be the end of it. And, of course, it wasn't like that. Goering had failed to allow for two decisive facts, not just the calibre of fighters the RAF would throw against them, but just how well organised and professional British air defence really was. Okay, speed up, coffee. Thank you. As Dave heads down towards Kent, he is flying into the heart of what was once the best defended airspace in the world. OK, so air pressure's good. The right is good. Air temperature, please. 80, so okay. that's fine. Okay, up here. Just be a little bit to the right, just a fraction. To the right. OK. And let's level out there. The man responsible for the system that would shatter the myth of Luftwaffe invincibility could not have been more different from Goering. The head of fighter command in 1940 was a doer Scot by the name of Hugh Dowding. Dowding was a career airman. He had come into the Air Force uh, right at the start of the First World War. He had continued to serve throughout the interwar period. He was a consummate professional who was nearing the end of his career. He was highly respected, but his nickname was Stuffy which I think says it all. Hugh Caswell Tremon here Dowding, magnificent name. He was a very meticulous fellow, enormous attention to detail, immense patience. He was a, a calm, rather imperturbable individual, not liked a lot by, by people, um, but I think that, that for once this was uh, a British commander in the right place at the right time. Dowding didn't really lead his men into battle. He played a role much more like the chairman of the board and left operational control to his group commanders. He had a very clear view of his role, which was simply to provide the air defence of Britain at all costs. Dowding created what was by far the most formidable air defence system in the world. And the great thing was that most people didn't realise that he'd done that at least for Goering. During the 1930s, Dowding quietly went about building an air defence system around southern England. Whilst most people were transfixed by the development of the new generation of fighters, it was Dowding's genius to realise that the most important task was to find the best way in which to use them. 
What emerges, in fact, is uh, that in our finest hour, the British behaved in the way in which they usually imagined the Germans to behave. And the Germans were actually rather British. The Germans were led by a romantic amateur. They failed to recognize the potential of the latest technology or exploit it. They had a very odd, old-fashioned warrior hero ethos, whereas the British were led by seasoned, ruthless professionals. They believed in teamwork. They played down the role of individuals. They had a very detailed plan that they stuck to. They were Teutonic and thorough. And so, of course, they won. Dave's trip to the south coast continues. Nice of the tent. Beautiful. Over the wing of this big farm. <laughs> In 1940, the British knew they were about to suffer an air assault of unprecedented ferocity. The fighting over the channel had merely been an overture. The only question was when the hammer blow would fall. But ever since he took control of fighter command, Hugh Dowding had been building up the world's most effective air defense system. Its greatest innovation was that for the first time ever, air warfare could be controlled from the ground. What made this possible was his secret weapon. Dowding had put his faith in a highly experimental system. At his insistence, a chain of 53 radar stations was built along the coast of Britain, covering hundreds of miles. It was huge, but utterly untested. What had he built? A war-winning weapon or just a white elephant? We, as pilots, knew practically nothing about this. We knew that these towers were being built and we were told they were something electronic. But we didn't really know what effect they were having on our activities until the battle, the battle started in 1940. There couldn't have been a better commander-in-chief to fight the Battle of Britain, in my opinion, than Dowding. He understood the role of radar. There might have been other commander in chief who might have been dismissive of it. Dowding was 100% for it, and he recognised that here was the weapon with which he could defeat the Luftwaffe. Without radar, he would have been so outnumbered that he would have had no chance whatsoever. The radar was very important to the RAF because they didn't need to fly standard patrols. They could conserve fuel, aircraft time, and flying time. Because at any given time, they knew exactly where the attacking forces were, which strengths, which direction they were flying. So at the last moment, they could set up the interceptors. The Germans knew all about radar, but for them, it was a naval technology to be used mainly at sea. They were bemused that the British should think it had any role against aircraft. Once during bad weather conditions, we were flying in the clouds, and suddenly a Spitfire formation came right up behind us, and we wondered how this was possible, having no visibility whatsoever. That was the first time we heard about radar. RAF fighters had VHF radios in the cockpit, that meant pilots would remain in constant contact with the controllers, who would update them on enemy movements, allowing them to get into the best attacking position. Most German fighters had to wait months to be given radios, and even then didn't like using them. Radar stations gave advanced warning, but only out to sea. Once over the coast, planes were invisible to it. But Dowding had a fail-safe backup. 30,000 men armed with binoculars, altitude calculators and telephones made up the observer corps. Information flowed down their thousands of phone lines into the filter stations, and from there to Dowding's HQ at Bentley Priory. Numbers, altitudes, aircraft types, bearings, everything Dowding needed to form a complete picture of the day's engagements. Having put all this together, you then needed a means of actually connecting the fighters with the enemy bombers. And this is where uh, Dowding's uh, foresight really comes in. He created a network which is probably best described as the world's first intranet. It's in fact an analog intranet system, a command and control system which is a network 
in which each bit of it can connect with every other bit of it. And information is passed all the way through it, up, down, filtered and out to whoever needs to take which decision at which particular time. Dowding had split the country into four groups. Each had a central control room, responsible for its fighter airfields and for deciding which squadrons to scramble. Till early August, the Germans had mostly attacked channel shipping, but that was about to change. The RAF braced itself against the tidal wave coming its way. The opening salvo of Goering's attack on Britain was scheduled for August the 13th, given a suitably Wagnerian codename, Adler Tag, or Eagle Day. He reckoned the RAF wouldn't survive a week. Now would come the biggest test for all Dowding's meticulously laid plans, his technological daring, and his strategic doggedness. Bearing the brunt of the attack would be the squadrons based in the southeast, belonging to 11 Group, coordinated from its base at Uxbridge. This operations room bore the brunt of the enemy air offensive in 1940, mainly by its proximity to the continent. You bear in mind the German Air Force was barely 20 miles away across the Channel, and ME-109 could be across within four minutes, so not much time to get squadrons airborne to intercept enemy aircraft. Uh, what took place in this building technically decided the fate of this country in 1940. That is why it was visited by Winston Churchill on several occasions. And indeed, the words, never in the field of human conflict, were so much owed by so many to so few, was actually said by Churchill on leaving this building on the 16th of August, 1940. He realized that this building held the fate of the country in its hands. The man in the hot seat was 11 Group Commander Keith Park. He was a very different character from Dowding but shared his strategic vision. If there is a forgotten hero at the Battle of Britain, then that man has to be Keith Park, a New Zealander who spent almost all of his career on fighters. Keith Park was right out of the top drawer. He used to visit us quite often. He came in very informally in his hurricane and find out how we were getting on. He was an approachable man and uh, a fighting man's man. He led from the front at Keith Park, and he was a very fine air officer commanding. Park was a, a remarkable commander. He had a very clear view of the battlefield. Um, he displayed, I think, throughout the battle a, a remarkable flexibility in his response to what the Germans were doing, um, profound tactical understanding. Park faced a gargantuan challenge. One single wrong decision, landing a squadron too early so they could be destroyed on the ground, or taking off too late to intercept, could have crippled fighter command and given Goering his easy victory. It required brinksmanship of the highest order. If one looks at his performance during the Battle of Britain, it is remarkable in that even with hours to ponder decisions that he took within minutes about which fighters to deploy, in which numbers, where, it's very hard to improve on the decisions he made. In preparation for Eagle Day, the Germans tried to disrupt the British fighter control system, especially its vulnerable radar towers. Squadrons of dive-bombing Stukas were given the job of destroying them. But once the smoke had cleared, it was plain little lasting damage had been done. In any case, there were many in the Luftwaffe who had no fear of radar, especially if it got the RAF up into the air ready to be shot down. Before Eagle Day, our radar defences should have been obliterated, and I mean obliterated. They should have bombed every station two or three times over, put it right out of action, and if they'd done that, They'd have won the Battle of Britain. As dawn broke on the morning of the 13th of August, Britain's air defences were in full working order, and they were to remain so all through the day. Instead of being the beginning of the end for the RAF, as Goering had hoped, Dowding's fighter command inflicted losses of three to one.
Not even the Germans now thought this would be over in a few days. Both sides readied themselves for a long, hard slog. Every morning, uh, Park would go down into the bunker, which constituted his command headquarters at Uxbridge. In this, there was a large map of uh, southern and central England, uh, which was, in fact, a plotting table on which raids that were coming in would be marked out by the WAFs down below. It was like a theatre. There's a raised dice, and Park would sit or stand with his senior controllers above this so that he had a complete view of what was going on, and he had the so-called tote board in front of him showing what his own forces were doing. He would take the decisions about which raids to intercept with which forces. They would have a list of how many squadrons were at readiness at various aerodromes. We were on duty half an hour before dawn. The engines used to be warmed up and we used to stick around, sometimes in our pyjamas. We'd have to be there at 0245 so that if there was a likelihood of us coming onto a readiness state by about three o'clock, we, we were in business. All Fighter Command could do now was wait for the first raids to appear on the plotting table. You would be told at, say, about 7 o'clock in the morning, the enemy is building up because they could see them. Breakfast time. And halfway through breakfast, there'd be the tannoy would go off and say, uh, 92 squadron to readiness, you know, and that was that. Always breakfast time. You were lifting the first bit of egg and bacon to your lips and scramble order would come. We were perhaps at readiness, and suddenly the bells would ring and somebody would shout to Villa Squadron, take off immediately, angels so-and-so. When the bell goes, it's exhilarating because you've got a hurtle off into your machine. You raced out to your aircraft, uh, climbed aboard, your, uh, your parachute was in position, so you uh, buckled that up as fast as you could, you pulled the straps over and pushed in the pin. Start up and taxi out. And then you get 12 Spitfires all sort of warming up, and you think, well, it's a bit ominous, Some, someone's going to buy it this day. As we were forming up, we'd get over the uh, tannoy system. 603 Squadron, please get into the air as soon as possible. Now the takeoff. Throttle right forward. Stick central. Ease her off the ground. Back with the throttle to normal boost. And now up with the wheels. Not every Spitfire on every airfield was at readiness all the time. They had to use them properly, like you'd use a tool. They couldn't just throw the lot in. The controllers and that had to be able to move these about like chess. They would decide which squadrons were to take off first, which to keep in reserve, or to have any reserve, or to decide whether it was a German feint with fighters only. On the ground, the controller would have known where we were and where we were going, where he thought we ought to go. <laughs> I mean, these skilled chaps could uh, tell us what to do, and with any luck, we were up there fast enough to get the height, and perhaps the sun as well. We're, we're getting the instructions to fly in a certain direction, to a certain height, to intercept the German formations. The controller would have told him they were very good at this, uh, what height to aim for and what direction to aim for, and how the enemy was approaching. They, were, they became very skilled at this. And, I mean, it was very much a team job, wonderful. However, once they had led the fighters to the German formations, there was nothing more that the controllers could do for pilots like Dave. It was now up to the squadron leaders to decide how to tackle the daunting odds they faced. The first time I went into serious action was against 150 plus. That's a lot of aeroplanes. And they were coming in over Dungeness, and I saw them in the distance like a lot of gnats going around on a summer evening, you know, with 109s above them. You know, when you saw that lot, you thought, well, where do we start on this lot? 
It was quite uh, overwhelming in that you weren't quite sure <laughs> what the best way to attack them. Throughout August, all along the south coast, squadrons of hurricanes and spitfires threw themselves repeatedly against hundreds of German planes. Amazingly, they were holding their own. Dowding's system was doing all that was expected of it. Trainee pilot Dave Mallon is in his fourth hour of Spitfire training. OK, Rad 78, um, at Centralized, oh, 60, one knots. His cross-country sortie has brought him to an area of Kent, known during the Battle of Britain as Hell's Corner, because of the ferocity of its air combat. If this was 1940, Dave would now be only five hours of training away from having to join the dogfights himself. The RAF was well supplied with planes during the battle. The real shortage was trained pilots. To help plug the gaps, Fighter Command took men from other branches of the services, including the Navy's flying section, the Fleet Air Arm. John Sykes was one such pilot. Well, you'd get this scramble and you'd belt off into the sky and we knew where we were going and we'd get into a rough formation and head for Dover. It dawned on me at some time or another that on the way down there we were going over Dover and that's where I went to school and that was a good thing. Of course, in the back of a schoolboy's mind, you didn't know whether to drop a bomb on it or carry on and do your duty, but there you are. Anyway, there was a box barrage on and some bloody gunner hit me with a shell. We well, didn't hit me, actually. The thing went bang underneath and caused me to crash land. No, but the thing that really irked me was being a sailor in an Air Force aeroplane, being shot down by a soldier. It was bad. The pattern of attacks was now set. Over the next few days and weeks, the Luftwaffe would try different combinations of planes and targets to help bring a decisive result against fighter command. The bombers came in, sometimes they'd go direct to the target and sometimes they'd go offset and then turn to the target. So you, the ground control couldn't guarantee that the bomber stream would go in the direction it started. The Germans had two major tactics at this stage of the battle. Bombers flew over in large formations, luring RAF fighters into the attack. German 109s would then swoop down from above. And if the RAF didn't attack, then the bombers would bomb their airfields unhindered. Either way, the Germans thought that fighter command would be on the ropes. The first bombing we took was at Middle Wallop, just as the airfield bombing started, and the siren went. They were dropping everywhere. Lumps of masonry were flying about, tables were erupting. We were right in the middle of it, so we shot outside as quick as we could, mug of tea in one hand, bread and jam in the other. We were only kids, mind you, 17, 18. But they knocked hell out of the place. They flattened the hangars. A string of bombs came through the top of the hangar, hit the hangar door and lifted it and dropped it on. A crowd of people running past. And we ran down to see if we could do it, but we couldn't. But there was a, a waft arm sticking out with a wristwatch on. Still going. We realised that something quite serious was happening, put it that way. Uh, we were losing a lot of aeroplanes. The, the Germans were doing a certain amount of damage to the infrastructure of fighter command that we were losing pilots, uh, and just more or less just keeping up. We were getting short of fuel, and the flight sergeant, the bloke in charge of the ground crew, said, we need some fuel, go and get some. <laughs> to me, <laughs> I'd have done anything to drive the tractor, which was towing a fuel bowser, so I jumped on and off. I went across the airfield, all hell going on, and I looked up, and there's a Heinkel 111. And as I looked up, I could see the bombs leave it, and it went like that. And the bombs came out. The tractor wasn't going fast enough for me. I got off it and ran, I ran and ran, until I couldn't run another inch. I was totally out of breath. I dropped down on the thing, and as I dropped, I heard these bombs drop in the main camp. Then I had to catch the tractor up and drive it back to dispersal. These attacks inflicted grievous damage, but airfields were up and running again within hours. And just as with the radar stations, Goering failed to press home his attacks. On the 15th of August, he expressly forbade his aircraft from attacking the same airfield two days running. In a stroke, 
he had virtually assured the survival of fighter command. Even so, the skies of Kent were becoming a very dangerous place for both sides. By the 27th of August, the two weeks fighting since Eagle Day had claimed 208 RAF and 413 Luftwaffe aircraft. Everybody in the squadron was either shot down or bailed out or crashed or did something all around Maidstone. In fact, we knew Leeds Castle like the back of our hand. We'd all landed there one time. <laughs> With losses escalating on both sides, Goering was the first to lose his nerve. Unhappy he was losing so many bombers, he issued orders that his fighter escorts should fly close to them and not high above as they had before. This made the bomber crews feel safer, but it stripped the fighters of their natural advantages, speed and height. The whole point of a fighter's advantage is the fact that it's fast, and now we were ordered to give up our speed and fly alongside the bombers. In doing so, we were totally inferior. In this situation, with the British flying towards us at a great speed from high altitude, we didn't stand a chance. This meant we incurred heavy losses. Davis returned to Duxford after the long sortie to the south coast. In 1940, he would now have faced a barrage of questions from intelligence officers trying to piece together a picture of the day's air fighting. Any claims, Johnny? Uh, a 109 destroyed, buddy, yes. Oh, good show. These combat reports were notoriously inaccurate as confusion and enthusiasm took their toll on the true picture of the day's events. And there used to be various people flying around who uh, would always get back a bit late when the rest of the squadron had already landed and say, oh, I, I, I went a bit north towards the North Sea, came across half a dozen chaps and shot two down, you see. These great fellows with their moustaches. Now, look at it from our point of view. We would shoot at our craft at 18,000 feet. We would record what we thought we'd done. The aeroplane would then go down. Don't forget, there would be 35 squadrons in the air at the same time. So it could well be that the airplane would be attacked three or four times before it hit the ground. For the Germans, the situation was made even worse by a system that not only encouraged wild overclaiming, but actually reduced the combat efficiency of their fighter squadrons. The Luftwaffe um, actually had an incentive system of getting awards, the Knight's Cross, the Swords and the Oak Leaves and so on, that was based on how many kills you got. Unfortunately, however, it produced a system in which these people became prima donnas, in which getting the highest score was the only thing that mattered to them, which demoralised the rest of them. And um, you get a ridiculous situation where you will get the whole of a Geschwader trying to protect their star ace as he goes out to shoot down one more Spitfire and actually ignoring the real tasks, which are to protect bombers. This was a tension the Luftwaffe suffered from right the way through the war. There was another disadvantage. As well as creating aces, the German system rewarded dishonest pilots prepared to fabricate their successes. So whilst both sides were overclaiming, for the Germans, it was creating a yawning reality gap, letting them believe they were inflicting far higher losses on the RAF than they actually were. German intelligence was convinced fighter command was close to collapse. Yet every day, German pilots discovered the RAF seemed as strong as ever. The dream of air supremacy was still a long way off. However, the Germans weren't the only ones making some serious mistakes. One of our great problems at the beginning of the war is we were not trained as well as the Germans. Our tactics were out of date. We used to fly type formations, which was absolute asking for murder, and we got the chop left, right and centre. Pilots were taught to fly in close formations of three, called VIX. This required great skill, but was useless in a dogfight. It forced pilots to spend all their time avoiding collisions rather than looking out for the enemy. But it's a skill Dave will still have to learn. We've brought in one of the current world experts in piloting Second World War planes to teach him this and aerobatics. My name's Peter Kinsey. I'm the chief pilot of the fighter collection here at Duxford. I was the British aerobatic champion for three years and went, represented the UK in uh, the World Aerobatic Championships and the Europeans. 
and uh, since I've stopped that sport I've been um, training aerobatic pilots and also doing display flying uh, instruction. I'm an examiner for the Civil Aviation Authority for display pilots. Okay, so Dave, what are we going to do today? Um, today's exercise is we're going to start off with formation flying and the position we'll be flying is a formation called Echelon, which is, there's the leader, and you'll be back here about 45 degrees back, just slightly behind the leader. While Dave pilots the dual-seater Spitfire with Carolyn, Pete will be leading the sortie in a single-seater Mark V Spitfire. Dave will be trying to fly as close in behind Pete's wing as possible. The original idea in the training was that you would be involved against bombers, not fighters. It was archaic in a throwback of before the war, peacetime, when they assumed that there'd be big bomber formations, so you must get a concentration of fire uh, against a big bomber formation, therefore keep all the airplanes together and then go in, so you had a concentration. Okay, you have control. Okay, I have control. Okay, keep your hand on the throttle at all times, so you can begin the join up now. Okay, you keep your look out. I am. You've got to keep in position to the left or the right of your leader. And it isn't something the aeroplane do itself. You're adjusting your throttle the whole time to keep in position. Keep the nose down a little bit, Dave. A little bit more power just to keep that position now. The trick with formation flying is lots of little bits of power. That's right. This is a complex operation that takes all the pilot's concentration and certainly doesn't give you time to look out for the enemy. So you're in perfect position now, I think. OK, I've got the elevator cutting through the windscreen yeah, there. So keep it there. You had to fly with your wing. In my case, I was number three, so I had to fly with one-third of my wing inside, behind the other wing, and about three to four feet behind it, so we were very close to the other aircraft. We cruised at about 220 miles an hour, so you had to be very much on the key wave. Of course, all the time you were doing that, you weren't looking round. You were looking at the at your leader. You never took your eyes off him. And if he missed something, then as a wingman, you got clobbered. I'm having a bit of a lookout for you, but basically your leader is your lookout. You trust him implicitly, which, of course, in the war is what it was all about. The English flew close together, in chains, and so it took them more time to realize they were being attacked. And we were often able to take them by surprise, including the Spitfire. There was one occasion when Bolter and I were flying at the back of the uh, formation, and we got jumped by a 109, and there was Green Tracer going in between us. And he went to the right automatically, I went to the left, and I was so close to him, I could see all the oil streaks coming down the Spitfire. Not only were the pilots told to fly in VIX, they were also expected to follow standard RAF attack guidelines. These involved forming into single file and opening fire as you slowly overtook the enemy one by one. It isn't hard to imagine what would happen next. There were 13 pilots, and uh, they only wanted 12. And so they drew out of the hat who was going to be on the lucky one, and it was me. So off went 19 Squadron, and they ran straight into a horde of Stukas, and uh, they methodically followed fight to command attack number one, and went in, and you went in at a very slow overtaking speed of the target, and they were very slow, Stukas. And these were for three boys were creeping in, ready. When, of course, down came the Messerschmitts and shot down the first three straight away. It was absolute rubbish. It really was. But we soon realised what was going wrong. I mean, you were a sitting duck going in at about 10 mile an hour overtaking speed. <laughs> it was clear tactics had to change if RAF pilots were to have any chance of winning the Battle of Britain. Pilot Dave Mallon is being taught how to fly a Spitfire in close formation, an out-of-date tactic learnt by RAF pilots prior to the Battle of Britain. Keep the nose down a 
slows down a little bit, Dave. That's nice. Yeah, we're, keeping, keeping low. we're keeping in plane with him. Formation flying is difficult to get into position, but I think I dealt with it reasonably well. Um, just gently trickles of the power and just concentrating all the time on the one point on the aircraft and trying to keep that in your line of sight all the time. But it's really, it is hard work. It's really hard work. Tight formations became highly unpopular with experienced pilots, and they soon started to develop their own tactic. A Sergeant Harker, a Budge Harker, and I started flying together and we worked out that if we flew about 300 yards apart level with each other we could protect each other by seeing if any air aircraft would try to attack them behind. And in fact it happened on one occasion over Dover Budge called me up and said watch out there's a chap coming up behind you so I went into a hard tight turn and had he not been able to tell me that I would have been shot down. The German pilots had adopted a loose flying formation in the years before the Battle of Britain. They developed a system called the Schwarm, where pilots flew in a well-spaced group of four planes with everyone able to cover each other's back and no danger of colliding with one another. The Germans had, had learnt this. Um, in the Spanish War, uh, it's far better to fly a loose formation of two aeroplanes, the rotor system, spread out each covering everybody else, uh, using everybody's eyes to look for the enemy. Experienced 11 group squadrons started adopting these loose formations early in the battle, but it didn't become general RAF policy till 1941, a delay that was to have terrible consequences. By the first week of September, two months of heavy fighting had taken its toll. Squadrons needed to rest and rebuild, and were replaced by units from the Midlands and the North who had little combat experience and no idea how seriously flawed their tactics were. Well, I was at Curtin Lindsay. We had one or two sorties to look for bandits coming in. We didn't really run into it until at uh, the end of August when we were sent down to relieve 264 Squadron at Hornchurch. And then we took off the next day and then you were right in, in, into a war, which really you hadn't been in before. Everything was peaceful up north, but down there it was, it was quite different. They were now locked in a deadly race, having to unlearn all their outmoded tactics before being decimated by battle-hardened Luftwaffe pilots who could not believe their luck. Their nickname for the Vic formation was the Row of Idiots. For the first time, the RAF looked in real trouble as losses mounted. These were dark days. To make matters worse, Park and Dowding were also fighting an internal political battle in fighter command against the head of 12 Group, Trafford Lee Mallory. 12 Group covered East Anglia and the Midlands, and it looked, before war broke out, as if that might be the place that any German attack would come from, because nobody reckoned on them capturing France. And so afterwards, 11 Group became more important. Lee Mallory had devised a new strategy, which he called the Big Wing, and was desperate for his squadrons to be allowed to try it. Rather than scrambling individual squadrons and attacking the Germans as quickly as possible, Lee Mallory thought it better to spend time assembling five or six squadrons into one large formation called a wing and then attack the bombers en masse, even if this meant hitting them after they had dropped their bombs on the airfields. This was not the way in which Dowding thought his system ought to be deployed, but Lee Mallory thought it sounded like a jolly good show because it would get him into the limelight as well. Rendezvousing at 25,000 feet with anyone was extremely difficult. You've no idea how big the sky is. If you're going to form up a wing, you can't just do it like that. It takes time, and time's not on your side. You've got to stop them getting to the target, not hit them after they've got to the target and gone back. Lee Mallory's plan was inadvertently jeopardising another RAF advantage. By and large, it was more worrying and more confusing for the enemy to be attacked successively by 10 individual squadrons than to be attacked all at once by 10 squadrons together. I was quite convinced, all 19 years old of me, that we were right and that Park was right and that we, by going in in small batches and hitting them, going back, going away, if you got away with it, and then going back and doing it again, 
I'm convinced that was the right way to do it. If you had too many rain aeroplanes in the sky all at one time, they would be very easy to see. Uh, it would give the enemy time to think about what to do about it. And when they actually did come into attack, uh, they would all tend to get in each other's way instead of being in what's called a target-rich environment, which is that most of the other aeroplanes you can see are enemies. You just, you know, get in there, fire, and get away as fast as you can. Even though Dowding and Park's defensive system was immensely effective, Lee Mallory's aggressive ideas appealed to powerful figures in the Air Ministry. In October 1940, Dowding and Park were called to book for not embracing big wings. In the months to come, they were both removed from their jobs, and in 1941, when the history of the previous summer's battle was written in an official booklet, Dowding wasn't even mentioned. However, their pilots weren't fooled by this airbrushing of history. He was a grossly underrated man, and unfortunately underrated by people who saw fit to be his uh, opponents. He was enormously fond of his pilots, and he referred to them as his chicks and so forth, and he wept when they were killed. The system Dowding created was an immense achievement which had ensured Britain's survival. And even if the establishment didn't realize it, the Germans certainly had. No, I think they were frightened of it, because he was absolutely imperturbable. He just realized that he had a better cause than they did, because they had a better cause, he was going to win. And he won. Dowding was really the builder, the creator of a weapon. He put all the bits together. He was the person who produced a system out of all the disparate elements, which in combination proved to be unbeatable. And if nobody had been around to put it all together, then attacking Britain from the air for the Germans might have been rather similar to attacking France from the air where there was no system and where the French Air Force was wiped out within days. He was the creator of a weapon. Churchill is the man who decided to use it, and Park is the one who actually picked up the weapon and wielded it in battle. I think those are the three names that you need to remember when thinking about the Battle of Britain. By the beginning of September 1940, Fighter Command was facing mounting losses, and something needed to change, and change fast. In our final program, Dave Mallon will complete his Spitfire training, and we'll find out how Park and Dowding's system and Churchill's vision saved Britain from defeat, and in doing so, changed the course of history. <laughs>